what I was asked to do is to talk about um, sort of the available tools and the challenges, and I'll talk briefly about the tools and, and uh, most, of the con most of the presentation. I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit about a challenge that we've been working on uh, as, a, as part of the program. Um, when we think about the available tools, I thought Tim did a nice job this morning sort of reflecting on, uh, on PERS regional programs in light of where we were with uh, pseudorabies. And we think back on pseudorabies and the fact that we eradicated that from the domestic swine industry and the tools we had then versus the tools we have now. And, and as I show in these next few slides, the tools we have now are phenomenal compared to what we had back then. And yet, we did it. Uh, so that was quite an accomplishment. Um, when we think about the available tools for PERS, and sampling now, restricting ourselves to sampling. We think obviously of the diagnostic tests, the ELISA test, the PCR, and the wonderful work that we're doing with sequencing with regards to trying to understand spread. And, and now we're going to use, uh, I think it looks encouraging what we'll be doing with this mapping program, BioPortal, is far, further understanding spread. So it's very interesting what we've got there. Then, then we'll think about these sampling tools that we didn't have, uh, back in the pseudorabies era, we really, Jeff Zimmerman pointed out to me, I think, that with the pseudorabies program, the, the, the concept of statistical sampling was a breakthrough. And if you remember, we, we sort of think today, Jeff, about 30, you know, everybody knows 30, well, they, and, and, and most people remember, well, that's 95-10. That's 95% confidence of detecting at least a 10% prevalence, let's say, and we're all comfortable with zero prevalence and, and with, with with statistical sampling, but back at the beginning of the pseudorabies era, that was new, uh, you know, with regards to using that tool. So we're all pretty comfortable with that and what that means. Then we, we, we weren't doing something back then that we are now commonly. We're all very comfortable with pooling. And Albert Rovira and Dale have pointed out the advantages of pooling samples when you have a choice where you can either increase your sample size for the same diagnostic test cost or you can, let's say, reduce your sample size and pool and um, maintain close to the same sensitivity of testing. So really a powerful tool, pooling. I'm going to talk a little bit in the next few slides about risk-based sampling because I think that uh, has got some real power that um, is available today that we need some tweaking, as I'll show you, but I think... Um, at the individual animal level, we've been doing risk-based sampling, and we're very comfortable, for, for example, going into a sow farm, and when you're doing your regular surveillance, we don't truly do a random sample. You'll do, perhaps, the sows that have the most likelihood of being positive, maybe aborted sows, or maybe sows that have been off-feed, or sows at the end of the trough. And similarly, with John Paul's work, when you go in to try and monitor purrs at weaning, you'll take what you think might be the high-risk pigs. Uh, those being, for example, John Paul found in one farm, barrows born to gilts that were light, if I remember correctly, John Paul. So that's risk-based sampling at the individual level. And where we're headed is, I think, risk-based sampling at the regional level that I'll talk about. Oral fluids, a uh, phenomenal breakthrough that's going to have uh, enormous implications in terms of our not only detection but our monitoring and the cost for each. And then lastly, we've got sow herd classification programs, the program that, that Dale and Daryl primarily led, and, and, and what a breakthrough that is in terms of how we monitor sow farms. And then this new program that you've seen in the AASV newsletter coming out that Lee Rosengren and her team has come up with in terms of not really, it, it's really, a, a, I think, a really innovative and powerful tool that takes statistical base sampling to the next level and looks at it over time. Instead of 30, 30, let's say 30 samples this month and 30 samples next month, you'd say, well, I'm 95% confident that the prevalence at least 10%. But we intuitively know that 30 over time gives you more confidence than that point in time. And so this certification program really looks at the value of sampling over time and what that does to your level of confidence about a herd being positive or negative. So that's another tool that we're going to be employing you saw it's going to be rolled out here in Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Quebec. Uh, it's real power, I think. And we'll see if, if sow herds and the customers thereof are willing to pay for that. The challenge is now, 
you know, coming out of these wonderful tools, you have some challenges. And the first one is, well, with regards to oral fluids, how should we sample? And, uh, you know, you know, should you do one, ro one, bar one rope per barn, t two ropes, ten ropes? Should you do one barn on each site? What should you do, given that it's a powerful tool? And we don't have that answer today. Uh, we've, similarly, you've got that wonderful classification guide for sow farms, but perhaps that doesn't apply for all situations, all farms. We haven't got, for example, sampling guidelines for the downstream flow. And so that's a challenge that we need to figure out, that we need to get some guidelines on. And then this risk-based surveillance. Well, it's a great tool, but how do we employ it? So, for example, how do we do surveillance in a herd, in a herd or region, I should say, that's thought to be largely negative? We don't have to test all sites. You know, and we go into Stevens, for example, and I'll show you an example in Stevens. Nobody wants to test anymore other than the breeding stock herds because they don't want to go out and catch sows or catch pigs when they believe they're negative and their risk is so low. So how do we, who should we test in that, in that region? Or who should we test in the North 212 region? Who should be our high priority uh, herds in the region? Who's got the highest risk given that in many of those farms up in the northern area of Minnesota, they've never heard of PERS? So that's risk-based surveillance at the region and allocation of resources. The other aspect of risk-based surveillance, I'm going to show you these geostatistical maps. They're useful for showing maps where the individuals don't want to have their status revealed. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. We, we, they're also called fuzzy maps because you can capture the knowledge from the region without revealing individual herd status. And I think it's a powerful tool that I'm going to show you right now. Oh, just before I do that. In terms of um, who's, who's doing what with regards to these challenges, we do have several working groups. You know that the AASV First Task Force assigned a working group led by uh, Jim Lowe to d develop a standard of practice for using those herd, sow herd classification guidelines, and that's being worked on. We've got several other working groups, two that three that I'll just briefly mention. This first one, um, you know, uh, sort of who within our association knows PERS and knows modeling and perhaps can address that question, it's Dale Polson. And so Dale has agreed to lead this challenge of, well, how should we take the oral fluid sensitivity specificity data and apply it at a, at a site level? And that's what Dale and his working group are working on. Uh, second um, working group is, well, what Given that we've got these standards for sow farms that maybe applies to most farms, but doesn't apply to all, doesn't apply to all regions, doesn't apply to the downstream flow, how can we take that further? And given Darrell's uh, work in the classification guidelines, he, he's leading this effort. So we've got, that's three working groups. We've got the SOP, we've got the oral fluids, we've got these sampling guidelines, and then we've got another one, risk-based sampling, and, and we're thinking, well, who's interested in risk-based sampling? Well, I am, and then all these folks here are also interested in risk-based sampling. And I'd like to just, given that you're a captive audience, I would just like to uh, delve into that a little bit further and tell you what we're doing about that. This is the North 212 Minnesota map, and each dot is obviously a farm. Blue is unknown, green is negative, and red is positive. Um, the unknowns might be unknown because they prefer not to participate, or perhaps they're participating but haven't tested. So you can see a lot of unknowns. Where should you, where should we prioritize our money would be a question. And, and so we can use risk-based surveillance, I'll show you in a minute, to, to prioritize which sites have the most implications of, of being positive. So we'll, we'll show that in just a second. This is a, this is um, a geostatistical map, or, or call it a fuzzy map. And what it does is it captures that same information, but it reveals it at the regional level without without revealing any herd's individual status. And you can see this is version one, because I'm going to show you a next version that we're working on. But here, um, you can obviously see this is Stevens County right here and the surrounding counties. And it's high green because it's thought to be largely negative, And it's quite dense because of the population that Enrique was just showing you. Um, we've got another area out here in Morrison County and also uh, negative, largely negative, largely negative, and uh, fairly dense. And then you come down into, in this area, the Renville County area, 
and there's a, an enormous amount of work going there because you can see it's a lot of positives and uh, and very dense. And then we've got some a few herds up here in the northern region, and the problem with version one is it gives undue emphasis to these relatively few uh, dots up there. So you can see, boy, they're almost as important in this map as we have down in Renville, but they're really not. So and, and, and so what I'm going to just delve into in a couple of minutes is say, well, how can we improve this? It's a great idea. You get the idea. You can see status. We don't reveal individual herds if they don't want to be revealed. We can show this on the web and so on and so forth. But it's, it's kind of not quite right. So here's what we're working on is many of those sites you, um, you saw are unknown. And right now, when we're making that map, we assign a 1 to a herd that's thought to be positive or a site, a 0 to a site that's negative, and a 0.5 to any unknown. So in other words, a static score for the unknowns. We have two really bright people working with us, Alex Zhang and, and Dane Getty. Dane's a veterinary student, extremely bright. He's going to be a great hire. Um, and he said, well, he and Alex said, well, rather than 0.5, you know, this unknown herd here is, is more likely to be positive, given its neighbors, than this known over here, given its neighbors. We really are, by assigning all unknowns a score of 0.5, we're not taking advantage of all the data we have. So just working together, okay, I'm going to run through a quick example. This one's three miles, this one's three miles, this one's two miles. What we do is we um, use a little formula here where the um, distance, we, we divide by the distance squared because you know that a herd that, let's say, is one mile away versus a herd that's two miles away, the risk is not linear. The, list, the risk goes down geometrically with increasing distance because of dispersion, right? So one over d squared then accounts for that, that decreasing risk over time. And what we do is we add up the, uh, the knowns to the, uh, to the unknowns. So we saw those three unknowns. We add up those unknowns. And you can see we start here with a score of 0.5. And this, to remind you, is our unknown herd that's surrounded by two positives and a negative. And we say, all right, we've got um, a positive, a negative, and a positive. And actually, it changes the, the score of that unknown from 0.5 up to 0.67. We're using its neighbors to interpolate the likelihood that that unknown is, is positive. Now, this unknown, but, but we, didn't, we didn't take into account that there's an unknown here was our unknown we were looking at. There's also this unknown here. So we have to, in step two, look at, well, what's that second, that's, what's that unknown herd contribute? Well, that unknown, how much that unknown contributes depends on its neighbors. Okay? So its neighbors are all negative. All negative. And so within five miles, at least, except for this unknown. So we can say, well, that unknown, that unknown actually has a lower likelihood of being positive. And it actually, when we run through these calculations, it's, it's close to, in our, in our preliminary methods, close to don't worry about it if it's surrounded by negatives. Okay? When we combine those two, we say, all right, we know the risk of this one relative to this. We know the risk one relative to this. Then that herd is 4.5 miles away. We combine all this and we say, that unknown that was 0.5 is actually 0.68. And so you have the uh, the score 0.68 now is allocated to this unknown based on its known neighbors, this unknown relative to its neighbors. Okay, and then when we it looks similar, but I'll show you in just a second. It's not quite the same. But then when we use version two, when we use these so-called dynamic scores for the unknowns, we get this risk-based map. And the difference, as I'll show you in a second, is that these kind of are not so profoundly positive as we see down in the Renville area. So just to show you that, you can see this is, uh, this is version one, and you say, oh my gosh, look at these. And this is version two, and you say, well, we better get somebody out there, get some testing, but it's not bad, bad. Okay, so that's what we're working on. And again, I want to emphasize that Alex, Alex uh, Zhang and Dane Getty are um, leading the charge on this. Um, okay, I just wanted to briefly show that in a worst case scenario, let's say we've got a project now in, in this one region and every, it's kind of new and everybody's kind of, this is actually true, they're really nervous about um, 
getting involved. And they, they don't want it. So far, they had their first meeting, and nobody signs the consent form. They, they, it's a good idea, but you do it. Uh, and so, in a worst case scenario, you'd say, well, producers won't participate because they're afraid of, of revealing their status. I don't think all is lost. Let me show you. This is Stevens in 2004, and, and this is using the actual herd status to, to define this geostatistical map. And then 2011, you can see, well, oh my gosh, they made pretty good progress. And we don't need to know the individual herd status in order to show progress over time. So it really doesn't, while you'd like to know your neighbor's status and you're curious and perhaps you can reroute people, I don't think you absolutely positively need to know in order to use data with a third party independent person generating these drafts and showing progress. The last piece of this I wanted to just say is we can use, um, we can take proximity to, to develop an, a score. But then we can take other factors or other features, risk factors, to, de to determine who are our high-risk sites within a region. And you think about, okay, if I've got, let's say, $10,000 to test all of these sites, who would I go to, to to go and determine their status? And you'd go, well, you'd go to um, those that have the most connectedness. In other words, those that receive the most pigs from the most recent sites. That'll be a good indicator. And you'd go to those that are flowing them out to the most sites. They're highly connected. So that would be a risk factor. You'd say, I want to use connectedness as a, as a feature for determining who I'm going to go test. Secondly, you'd say, well, proximity. If I know some herds around and I don't know other herds, I can use proximity to establish risk. Thirdly might be size. Small farm, more likely to be negative than a big farm. Well, we can take all these risk factors and rather arbitrarily, using C to the pants math, calculate a risk-based score for all sites. And that's what this is. And the redder the, the, redder the, um, the color, the more likely, or the more, and the more you want to go and get that site tested. And so maybe I can show you Stevens a little bit better. As I said earlier, Stevens, we believe, is largely negative based on the testing that's taking place lack of clinical signs, lack of evidence, whenever testing is done, we don't find anything. But not everybody's testing. Well, if, if you went to some herds and tested and encouraged them to test, who would you go to? You'd go to the red dots. Okay, You'd go to that herd and that herd, for example. But, you know, these orange ones, these white ones, they're relatively low risk relative to the rest. So this, this whole thing of estimating risk and using risk-based surveillance at the regional level has some very powerful... Uh, applications. Uh, last slide, I just, um, as you know, uh, the PERS.org is where if you're a PERS CAP project, right up top there it says PERS Regional Programs, and we have all of the data that is presented from each one of the uh, regional projects on a quarterly basis. One of the things we'd like to do is to share and show other data from other projects. So if you are interested and are willing, we'd love to show your data in a non-revealing way. So perhaps a geo map over time or whatever. So I, I, I probably will try and contact you and try and see if, if there's anything we can do. So from a national point of view, we can see how we're doing.